a team meeting uh, in Google Meet. So thanks to Parkside. Thanks for Nina for the technical support. And uh, also thank you to Clemens and Clemens uh, for us this interesting talks about uh, design ops and uh, cognitive load. For uh, all of the people who are uh, here and wondering what all this word cloud is about, it's just to get to know uh, where every one of you is joining us from. So um, now let's get back to the presentation. We're at the UXB Austria Meetup Online. Why online? Because of the current situation. And I hope that it will change sooner or later, hopefully sooner. I uh, don't know when we're going to have an on-site uh, meetup again, but I think it's great. And we have an international uh, group around here. So welcome to all of you. And good morning to the people in the United States and Costa Rica. I think it's also morning. so. Good morning to you. Uh, good afternoon to, or good evening to uh, all of the rest. And uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, design ops today. Clemens Posch, uh, Posch, sorry, Clemens Posch is talking about design ops. Um, it's an interesting talk. I already heard it at the World Usability Congress, or maybe parts of it. I don't know if it's actually the same, but uh, we will listen to it later. And a uh, second interesting topic. It's uh, a different topic, but it's uh, also very interesting and also important for user experience, um, is about cognitive loads in uh, UX or UX design. And um, just to get you all involved in our uh, meetup, I also have a second poll. And I uh, just wanted to ask before we dive into all of the meetup thing just uh, at slido.com again um, maybe you if you're not from the design team uh, maybe you also know about what the design team uses uh, tools for collaboration in between or if you are from the design team just let us know what tools you're using and uh, i put in my favorite one uh, adobe xd if you're using anything else uh, feel free to share it with that with, with us uh, the poll is activated and uh, we will talk about this uh, after the design ops um, presentation. So we can uh, talk about the differences and why you choose uh, either the one or the other one. You can also post uh, multiple answers there. So um, that's uh, for the meantime. Um, and now I'm going to what we are uh, going to talk about today. Uh, on our agenda today, the plans for today, this is what I'm presenting right now. Then we have this, the first talk I already mentioned from Clemens Posch, Parkside, uh, who is talking about design ops. Very important topic if you're uh, working together as a team. Then we will have a short coffee break, or you can also take grab a beer or wine or anything else but just to get your brains free because the talk number two is um, very interesting, but you will need uh, maybe a short break before because uh, cognitive load is, yeah, we will talk about it later. So <laughs> I think you will uh, need the break before that um, just to be, be active and uh, uh, can take a lot of uh, important and uh, interesting input with you. So um, afterwards, I also um, want to ask you about feedback uh, on our um, now second online meetup, because we also uh, want to improve and uh, improve the meetup for you. So the knowledge uh, share sharing will get better. And uh, we want to make it as good as possible to uh, provide you interesting topics here. And last but not least, if we have time, and if you have time, uh, you're more than welcome to stay online and talk to the people just for networking reasons. Um, if you find some time in between um, in the coffee break or before the talk, uh, you can also go to slido.com. There is uh, one section called ideas and just drop any ideas that uh, you want to listen to, you want to talk about. Um, 
I'm uh, very interested in anything that uh, you want to share, but it's not only about what you want to share. You can also share ideas, what you want to listen to. So just drop any ideas in there and you can also vote them up uh, by clicking the thumb up, you know. So um, that's uh, about our agenda today. And uh, all of the people who already have been here before uh, know the, sec the next slide. Uh, we have a lot of UX events in Graz and around Graz. Um, the next offline meetup, uh, I already said, is uh, currently not available. We're uh, going to plan an offline meetup because um, Codeflugel, um, who is uh, hosting hopefully the next offline meetup, uh, told me that the uh, topic they're talking about is uh, better to present offline um, the uh, user interfaces of the future. Uh, if we are not able to have this offline meetup, maybe we can uh, hold it online, but we're um, always planning new meetups uh, online. Um, as some of you might already have heard, the World Usability Congress uh, this year was postponed to next year, so it's not going to be held um, this year, uh, but instead, and that's a very great uh, opportunity and uh, thanks to Hannes Robier for making this possible. Uh, I think Hannes, you're also online and maybe you can say a few words afterwards, but we're having a World Usability Connect 2020 on October 19th and uh, 23rd, 2020, which is an online event. Uh, Hannes, are you around somewhere and can tell us a few words about that? Um, Hannes, I don't think that we hear you right now. Is it only me or? No, there is no sound. Okay, there is no sound. So, um, Hannes, maybe you can provide us the information also uh, in a oh, short. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, now. Thank you. So maybe you can uh, say a few words about the uh, Connect 2020. And it's, I think it's really loud um, because my wife is doing a workout in the, in the next room. Um, the Connect 2020 is from October until uh, the October 23rd. So we have to connect five days. It's ah. an online event, um, the best of the last eight years. So um, all great speakers from the last eight years are will join. Um, and we have se seven topics at this online event from psychology to engineering, strategy, UX buy-in, custom experience, and a lot of more. So you can be excited. It will be one of the best lineup from the last eight years. OK. So thanks for this. Um, I just put. Uh, I hope I have it right here. Um, World Usability Congress uh, dot at uh, or com. Does anyone know? Dot com. Dot com. So uh, just uh, go on the website of the World Usability Congress, and you will find the connect. And um, sorry for the uh, misunderstanding. It's uh, from nineteenth till. 23rd, so it's five days and not two days. Uh, I was wondering, but yeah, great option. And uh, the World Usability Congress will be held in uh, 2021. So uh, hopefully uh, we will at least meet some of you guys there. Um, and uh, finally, uh, I have a very, very uh, new, uh, I didn't change it on the slides already, but uh, we will have the World Usability Day together as uh, or unite as an Austrian uh, meetup uh, or World Usability Day Austria. Um, we connected with uh, the Vienna group at uh, the moment, and I think uh, Linz and Salzburg will also join. And uh, we will have it also as online event for anyone who wants to join in November 2020. So there's no uh, separate UX day in Graz. Uh, we will uh, make it together as Austrian event. So if you're interested in Stay tuned, and I will inform you about the updates in the next uh, meetups. So, um, are there any questions from your side up to now? You can just post the questions in the chat if there are any questions in between. 
If not, um, for anyone who did not connect yet, um, I just uh, show you the uh, the Slido. So uh, we have the ideas, we have the live polls, um, and we have audience Q&A. So if you have questions in between for uh, the speaker or uh, which have to or should be answered after the talk, just drop your questions in the Q&A section. You can leave it open. We It's for the whole event. And um, the live poll for the uh, tools of collaboration will stay open until the end of the talk as well. So um, then I hand over to Clemens, uh, Clemens Posh. I have to be clear in that case because we have two Clemens here. And uh, you will present, uh, you will talk about uh, the design ops topic. So welcome, Clemens. Exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, let me check. So famous last words. Uh, can you see my screen? You've heard that phrase probably like, hundreds of times in the last couple of weeks. So here we go. I think you should see everything now, right? Good. Yeah, it looks great. Awesome. Hi, everybody. And uh, also, thanks for joining this meetup uh, from the Parkside side of things. And thank you, Johannes, for organizing uh, and taking care of us. Um, I don't want to speak for the other Clements, but I think it's safe to say that we both are uh, incredibly excited uh, to welcome all of you to this session. And yeah, usually when we host such meetups uh, in our Parkside office, uh, we provide snacks and drinks and of course uh, the location. But in this case, uh, I just like to encourage you to maybe grab a cold one from your fridge because before the core topic of uh, the sign ops, I'll just spend like a couple of minutes to talk about um, our company. Um, and second, of course, this talk is uh, best enjoyed with a cold drink. And I, I thought I'd just like lead by example and uh, uh, pour the first glass of wine. So um, you're not the first ones to do that. Um, yeah, kind of like maybe set the right mood. So uh, cheers to all of you. Um, okay, let's get started. Parkside it is a design and uh, engineering company. Uh, we're working in the areas of uh, product development, uh, user experience, user interface, um, design, and software development. We serve clients in many fields such as fintech, edtech, mobility, and uh, uh, latest even the aviation industry. What we try to do is um, fuse code and design in something um, valuable that is more than the sum of its parts. This is our uh, beautiful uh, headquarters. Uh, and uh, we, we opened them uh, uh, again this week, which is great. So more and more people are uh, joining after, after the crisis. And um, if the office is full and everybody's in there, uh, we're currently a team of over uh, 80 digital enthusiasts um, based uh, in Austria, but coming from all over the world. And yeah, since 2007, uh, we help uh, innovative companies to build, uh, improve and scale their digital products and services. Some quick facts maybe, uh, as I said, 80 employees, uh, we're around 32 uh, and I uh, have 22 different nationalities uh, in-house. As I said, 2007, a uh, year of foundation, um, and currently uh, roughly 60% of our revenue uh, comes from the US, um, and 90% of new business uh, comes from uh, recommendations. So what about Corona? Um, three aspects, maybe I want to touch on culture, processes, uh, and even new business development. And as you can see me humble bragging with screenshots of remote meetings, uh, we tried to still keep a nice uh, team culture um, and had some fun while working. Uh, luckily, our processes um, did not have to change much as we had the perfect setup with you know, all of our cloud-based tools. Um, and also long-term clients and projects have not been affected much. However, what we see on the market 
uh, currently is that a, a sizable number of companies have been caught off guard by the forced digitalization um, owing to the recent lockdown, of course. Um, and that's why we started a little something and it's called the Digital Alliance. And as part of uh, that, we want to give these businesses um, the opportunity to modernize without having to run the risk of making huge investments to achieve that. And it is now becoming very clear that there is no way around digitalization. So what we did basically is we joined forces with two prominent agencies from Austria. So the first one is Wild from Vienna and Toba from uh, Bregenz. And in this alliance, uh, we are now consisting of around 200 experts uh, with a comprehensive offer in the form of uh, clearly defined packages with real added value. This means that concrete solutions for digital problems and companies can be achieved within just you know, two weeks and within a smaller budget uh, like uh, 10K. You can check out the initiative on digitalalliance.at and this is something that uh, a service that uh, we want to um, provide to uh, all of Austria. Okay, um, but enough from Parkside. Uh, back to the topic of design ops. We still talk a bit about Parkside because it's just you know neatly tied to it. And yeah, let's let's get this started. I hope everybody has a, um, a cold drink by now. Um, the talk is called Design Ops, uh, Establishing Operational Excellence and Designing for Scale. And uh, my name is uh, once more Clemens Posch, and uh, I'm Design Director at Parkside. And in my role as Design Director, I'm responsible for leading the design team uh, of uh, 11 people and defining the strategy for our design team's growth uh, together with the partners. So the concept of design ops and applying a design ops mindset uh, helps me with just that. Um, this talk is divided in two main segments. The first one is design ops um, and how to aim for operational excellence, while the second part is about what designing for scale means for us at Parkside. Our vision as a design team is to become an industry leading team, of course, that uh, fosters research, creativity and innovation by designing solutions with a positive impact. And we believe that design is contextual and innovation comes in many forms. So by collaborating with our engineering department, our customers and their users, uh, we try to accomplish this kind of well designed and, and thought through functional experiences that, that people love to use. But why the sign ups and, and why do we need it now? Okay, let's just get started. So each designer, um, like five years ago, was using different set of tools. We didn't have like much to do which is with each other on like a project pay base. There was like a lack of meaningful collaboration uh, between us as each designer was capable of working you know, alone on a project. There wasn't a real design process in place, uh, so the handoff to developers was quite messy at times as well. So at some point, we just decided that we can do better than that. But it was not only our decision, right? And I think you, uh, a lot of you have to have the same problems or had the same problems. At the same time, our design team was uh, confronted with another set of challenges. Uh, we needed to grow, that was the first thing. Well, the whole company was growing, uh, which meant we needed to support more parts of the organization. Uh, and we had to work on cross-team collaboration workflows with new business units in place. So uh, new business units that um, grew were like HR, business development, uh, QA, uh, all of them needed our support as well. Our design solutions became more and more complex and projects got bigger, meaning more designers had to work simultaneously on one project. Of course, we needed to improve the quality and impact of our design outputs and our design tools uh, become more complex 
in proportion to the systems being the same. So um, I think a lot of challenges sound familiar to you. Uh, but all of that, while well, everybody expected that better user experience should already have arrived by now, right? So everyone insists on better design uh, and better design outcomes. But this is fine, right? We've got this. And because of these challenges, design operations is something that a lot of organizations are talking about right now. And that's a big deal. It means that people are acknowledging and embracing the value of UX and design so much that we've reached a place where conversations about how to scale it have become mainstream. We are, of course, not the first ones with these problems. Design-driven companies like Uber or Airbnb or Spotify, you name it, uh, had to deal with those problems years ago. But before we start with that, let's level set on what exactly the signups means for us as UX professionals. Um, though I use the blanket terms design and designer who do this talk, design ops applies to anyone using user-centered and design thinking processes to solve problems. So we're all in this together. The term designer then includes UX designers, user researchers, visual designers, content strategists, you name it. Basically, anyone else contributing to the end user experience. I love that slide. Uh, that was a lot easier like 10 years ago, we were all just like web designers or something. Design ops is the orchestration and optimization of people, processes and craft in order to amplify design's value and impact at scale. But what does that really mean? Let's have a closer look and begin with dissecting design ops um, so we can break it down into three main categories. First is how we work together. Let's call it the culture. It's the human resource part of what is basically just, we're a bunch of humans, we're working together and designers are unique. How do we make sure that uh, designers have what designers need? We can focus on better organizing, or how we structure our team, or it could include thinking about how we collaborate and to treat designers like humans first and not like caged animals. This means designing career pathways, onboarding practices, and professional development um, specifically for designers. The second part, um, the signups can help us improve how we get our work done. That means thinking intentionally about how we standardize. How do we facilitate design quality through consistent tool sets and processes? We need to document the design process and align appropriate activities and tools to each stage. Or how we harmonize and prioritize. How do we make decisions about what projects to work on and when to work on them? Prioritizing could include exposing bottlenecks in the design workflow and understanding design team capacity. The final area of design ops is the ecosystem or how our work creates impact. This means making design accountable by defining and measuring design quality, creating definitions of good and done, and tracking metrics to ensure design quality is really reaching the, the bar we've set. We need to educate on the role and value of design and cultivate understanding even by those outside of the design team. Because if we want to truly scale design, we have to put our tools in the hands of people outside of our own design team so that we don't become bottlenecks um, in the process. With all these elements in place, what we've created is basically uh, a menu of potential design ops components you might choose to invest in as a, as a company and as a design team. And yeah, good. So we can spend the rest of the talk like three hours to just go through all of these, right? No, of course not. Um, this is such like a vast opportunity space uh, that we need to remember when deciding where to begin, we need to create a focus area. 
we need to adapt the specific meaning of the signups to the biggest pain points that you believe the signups can help alleviate within your specific context. So think about your biggest pain points and go from there. It's also incredibly important to have that operation function as part of the design team and it's there to support people, not bureaucracy. We do this to unblock designers so they can focus on their craft. That's really important. Remember that one. Because as we designers figuring out our process, oftentimes it's meshed into the rest of the product development process. In our case, that would be like engineering, right? So if you're working close to software development, you've probably heard the term uh, DevOps, which is their operations function that manages the process of development. However, design doesn't mesh one-to-one -one with that process. Either there is print ahead or they're working in parallel or the things they're working on, the timing is slightly different. What maybe takes engineering to develop one sprint might take design for concept and design free sprints or the other way around. What I want to make sure is that designers are designing and that they can focus on their craft and on our purpose and not being worried about things like, is my computer working? Do I have the software I need? Uh, whom do I need to communicate with? Uh, how do I communicate? How should I deliver? We want designers designing. So operations are responsible for all the overhead that makes design happen. Designing for scale and scale also needs a proper definition and has a different meaning for everybody. So I just want to show you what scale currently means for us at Partlet. This is PicMonkey. PicMonkey is a Seattle-based client, which is uh, basically just an online imaging, uh, image editing tool, uh, uh, just an online imaging editing tool. It's pretty powerful, go check it out. And our engineering team helped moving its 2.5 million user base from old flash technologies to new ones. In this case, we have an ongoing relationship with them where during the course of uh, over three years and ongoing, I think, uh, over 15 people participated in the process in any given point uh, with the Parkside engineering team as the driver, with, which is uh, frankly amazing. Or LinkedIn, uh, I think I don't have to introduce this one. Um, we initially, we created their mobile learning apps, but currently we are working on another project with them. I can't tell you much about it because of uh, some tight NDAs, but what I can tell you is that uh, we're working on 500 plus screens with a team of roughly 15 people, UX designers and engineers combined. Um, and that defines scale currently for us. So how do you achieve this? How, how can you work in a setup like that? You don't have to form a, a dedicated design ops team for that, but maybe rather start with um, adopting a design ops mindset or strategy. What I mean is not only think about the surface of your work or design system, we rather need to deliver on all levels of the scale. On top of that, uh, standards and documentation assures um, that the assembled results have a more holistic user experience. LinkedIn's massive and complex service, for example, requires a much more uh, systematic approach. So according to um, Christine Skinner, uh, she's, she's worked with uh, Chase and Capital One and Microsoft, uh, she did this uh, scale, um, and I borrowed it from her for the slides. Um, you should spend around 20% uh, of your time with figuring out the strategy and the big picture, thinking about how your design solutions fit into the company's entire offering. So not, don't spend all of your time with you know, the surface level design. Let's talk a bit about our process. Parkside is working with clients in different fields and stages uh, for the entire digital product lifecycle. 
which means our process needs to adapt accordingly. The only common denominator is that they are in one of the following three stages. So either they're, uh, they want to create a new digital product uh, or service, you know, like MVP thinking, fast to market, or they need to improve uh, their existing system or platform. So the product needs to scale um, with new features. We need to refactor some UX UI, or we need to rebuild legacy applications on uh, modern frameworks. So the product is already in the mass market, well established, but it's using like old technologies. So we need to do re-engineering and the refactoring of UX and UI. In the discovery phase, we try to understand the client and the business model. Strategy, of course, what's the scope? What are the UX goals? Do we need an MVP? How does the market look? Where are the competitors? Then we do some exploration, some high-level design direction, proto personas, requirements engineering, and software architecture. And of course, uh, user research, some interviews, evidence-based personas, questionnaires, you name it. I don't need to tell you much about that. But what I want to point out is that uh, this is always a cross-team effort, including business development, software engineering, um, because we want to make sure that we build the right thing, right? Only then we can move on and really build the thing right uh, with our like agile uh, workflow. So let's have a closer look at the design tools and, and methods we apply. We started standardizing the tools we use for design work and have taken a more agile approach to tooling. So we use the tools and methods that we find useful. And once we grow out of them, we change the tools to more suitable ones. So what I will show you next is a current, uh, current snapshot of what works for us. First, uh, the basics for communication, project management, et cetera. Uh, Parkside Communication basically runs on Slack uh, in combination with the Google Suite and the Atlassian's uh, Jira and Confluence software. Um, and yeah, some of uh, uh, design related tasks um, on Lucidchart. Um, but if we look at the design tools itself, I think it's uh, better to split them up um, into four categories. Uh, first one, is a repository. It's a design system or a central hub for all of our design work. We need tools and methods for designing itself, of course, uh, how things look and work. Uh, we need to look at how things interact, so to prototype. And uh, we need tools for handoff, uh, so supporting your team's transition from design to engineering. So let's begin with the first one, a repository. So. For those who don't know, a uh, repository or repo for short um, is our central hub for all of our design files. Uh, what we currently expect from a solution like this, um, file management, uh, true version control, uh, unlimited storage, of course, collaboration tools, uh, inspect for implementation, some advanced security features, uh, so on and so forth. Just needs to be um, in real time, production ready and future proof. But why do we even need the repository that stores and manages our data and our design files? One thing that stands out and bothered me for years about the collaboration between designers is the following. Have a look at this. Does it look familiar to some of you? I guess so, right? So what's the final version? Oh, where did you drop the file? Oh, somewhere on the server. Oh, no, I created another subfolder. So it's just a messy way of working. And even if uh, you have like a really uh, high work ethic uh, for, uh, you know, organizing files, it gets messy at, at times, at least if, uh, some client revisions come in. And by the way, if you ever name something final, you automatically doom it to more revisions. I can assure you that. I have another gift for you. A 
It's my all-time favorite GIF. <laughs> good, but you know what? The, the good thing about all of those uh, versions um, and the version control issues, developers uh, solved that problems for us designers 15 years ago. And they solved it with the Git workflow uh, back in 2005, I guess. So um, is anybody familiar with the terms master, branch, commit, merge? So if yes, you can go grab like another drink. I'll just explain that briefly. For all the other ones, I'll, I'll, I'll just you know briefly try to explain it uh, in, in my words, uh, yeah, as a, as a non-developer. So Git is a like distributed version control system for tracking changes in source code during software development. And it is designed for uh, coordinating work among programmers, but it can be used to track changes in any set of files. And its goals include speed, data integrity, and support for distributed and nonlinear workflows. And this is how it works. Basically, you have like a master branch, and if you develop the branch of that master file, and can simultaneously work with uh, many developers on uh, different features. Uh, everything is neatly organized, you know, um, what is going on, uh, which is the master file, which is the final version, uh, while you explore different features and options. And luckily, um, the guys from Abstract um, like translated that concept into something visual for designers. So we can work together on the same file now. We can review the differences and decide which one is the right one. We can merge many branches into a master file so that we save um, many times instead of uh, managing by hand. You know? We can collaborate through the team with comments and suggestions. And we have a version history so that we can move through the timeline, opening, editing, and reviewing the design more and more time. Uh, and most important, we have a clean, stable, and updated master file. We know the status of the work for the several tickets uh, we are working on. There are just some uh, screenshots of the software, so everything is organized into uh, projects. And here you can see some of like how our projects are set up. Uh, this is, I think, our website. And here you can see some, um, some merges or commits I did. Uh, I think that was end of last year. Um, if you're like really um, uh, keen on your processes and integrating it uh, with your product owners into Jira, uh, you know you can put in your your uh, Jira numbers there as well. Let's move on. Um, design how things look and work. Uh, let's have a look at the market. Maybe I think there's a huge fight currently with uh, Figma, Sketch, and the Adobe Stick Experience Design. Um, on the, on the market between uh, designers and teams and every, everybody's rooting for, for different softwares. Uh, but I think we've reached a state where those tools are nearly identical in terms of uh, the feature set. Um, for us at Parkside, Sketch is still the production powerhouse where we uh, invested already a lot of time and projects within their ecosystem. And for a team of 11 designers, uh, it's just a bad fit, uh, bad, uh, best fit for us currently. And uh, don't get me wrong, if I would be a freelancer, I probably would have switched to Figma already. Uh, so I think it always depends on your individual uh, situation. But today, I don't want to talk about the design tools itself. Um, I want to highlight two of our methods and principles that you can uh, achieve with any of these tools. Uh, one of our guiding principles is to be consistent. Back in the day, you know, uh, it could be really messy. If you remember, like, uh, uh, for those Photoshop files, I don't know who, who organized them. Uh, I didn't. I was, like, really messy with them. Uh, <laughs> so we set um, some uh, guidelines, uh, and we introduced uh, the eight-point grid system, for example. So why does it matter? Because uh, you can create more consistent UI. Because when all of your measurements follow the same rules, you automatically get a more consistent UI, right? Fewer decisions, 
are also less time. Because by removing seven of every eight spacing options, you reduce the amount of fiddling available to you and subsequently reduce speed to code. And also the variety of screen sizes and pixel densities uh, has continued to increase, making the work of asset generation also more complicated for designers. And if you utilize an uh, even number like eight to size and space elements, that makes scaling a lot easier. Um, yeah, so imagine like three designers working on the same page. Everybody tends to space things like a little, you know, differently. And if you restrict yourself to like, you know, increments of eight, um, design works becomes a lot more consistent. Also, developers will love you um, because, you know, if there's like, if they have to do pixel pushing, they know what they can, uh, which guideline they can follow as well. Also, uh, the atomic design principles, you probably heard of them. Uh, it's a methodology composed of five distinct stages uh, working together to create interface uh, design systems in a more um, deliberate and hierarchical manner. So the five stages of atomic design are um, atoms, uh, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages. So what you can do with those is you can quickly shift between real abstract and concrete design. And this is how it looks, uh, for example. So atoms are the smallest building block um, of your designs, you know, like switches, uh, checkboxes, radios, some colors, uh, text, and icons. And if you put two or three of them together, suddenly they become molecules. So some you know, input fields or cards, some smaller ones. And if you put um, more of these together, then suddenly you have organisms. So these are now integrated into like a, a map or something like that. And um, if you place them in your template, with templates, which are uh, our wireframes, uh, you end up with fully designed uh, pages. This is like uh, the Right Amigos app we created uh, one and a half years ago um, for one of our clients in Bloomington, Indiana. It's uh, live on the App Store as well. If you want to track your commutes, uh, you can download it right now. So, atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages. Uh, and this is how we handle it in real life. So, all of our atoms and molecules are sitting inside our symbol library. Um, these get like um, moved into a component library to create molecules and organisms. And then we finally have our uh, sketch files where we're working on, um, you know, different pages, different features, um, and we can like really easily scale um, and work with many designers uh, on many different features uh, versions, but still having like a, a design system in place that is fed out of these uh, symbol libraries and component libraries, and. Yes, uh, you have to have like a dedicated person that uh, manages um, these libraries. Um, you have to be careful with, with uh, changing stuff, but uh, most of the time it works pretty, pretty well. And once more, this is how it looks uh, inside of abstract. So as you can see, there are like two uh, libraries in there, a symbol library and the component library. Uh, and different uh, pages and, and files we worked on, uh, some case studies uh, on, on different pages. So this is how it looks in real life. So next one is prototyping, how things interact. Um, there's a lot of tools out there again. Um, mainly we rely on InVision uh, because most of our prototypes uh, just need to be uh, click dummies. Um, if we want to have like 
more or higher fidelity prototypes which showing like a lot of uh, interactions uh, we tend to use um, principle or framer and sometimes um, if it has to be done like really fast I love to use just keynote for showing like quick animations <laughs> it's my my guilty pleasure doing doing animations in uh, in keynote um, yeah, in Vision, uh, because we love uh, some of their features, uh, of course, uh, a lot of uh, you will know those uh, freehand, uh, which is like incredibly useful if you're hosting like remote workshops uh, now with, uh, with your clients or as we have to do with all of our US clients, um, we utilize the craft feature, which also looks uh, quite messy at times, but uh, most of the time it works and we need tools for supporting our team's transition from design to engineering. Um, this is like uh, mostly the choice uh, of our developers. So we ask them, you know, what, how do you want uh, the handoff to be? And most of them still prefer uh, Zeppelin. Um, I think, like you know, uh, Zeppelin and Envision with the inspect features are uh, pretty similar. I think Zeppelin added like a lot of um, functionalities and features with their style guide uh, feature set, so you can have like parent style guides for you know different platforms. If you have like slightly varying um, libraries for, for example, iOS and Android or, st or stuff like that. So um, that's why we currently. Uh, have most of the handoff done in um, Zeppelin. So this is how we currently standardize um, with a tool set that is inspired by the way developers work. So with a Git based version control tool and uh, some principles that support uh, designing for scale. And all of that was just like a fraction of, of what design ops can do for us as designers and our organization. So that was just a tiny uh, part uh, of standardization in the, in the whole realm of, of design ops. And I would like to encourage you to think about the biggest pain points that you believe design ops can help alleviate in your specific context. And remember when deciding where to begin that you really need to create a focus area and go from there. Because only then you can pave the way and establish operational excellence in order to amplify the science value and impact at scale. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great talk. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Clemens. So, um, for anyone who's got a question, I posted the link, I repeat it in the chat, uh, drop your questions in our uh, live questionnaire. I am going to share my screen again so we can look into all of the, all of the questions we have two up to now. So can you see my screen again? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, okay. Um, I start with the other questions. Uh, there was one question in the chat also by uh, Patrick. Uh, you use Envision Solili for uh, prototyping and abstract for a version control and collaboration. Um, yes. Um, so I think we have like a, a, a history with Envision. Um, you know, we started with working with Envision like three or four years ago, and um, we just love it to to use it for for client communication and for uh, collaborating with with clients. Um, abstract uh, we use more like for internal uh, collaboration, so like it's like more or less design team only. Um, maybe some handpicked developers uh, who can also uh, uh, work with us on the designs. But uh, all of the collaboration that happens like within the design team, like if we ha host some review sessions, um, this is what we're doing uh, in, in abstract. And InVision is more like 
uh, you know, like the, the external uh, tool where we share finished uh, click dummies, finished um, uh, uh, presentations or, or screens with the client. Mm -hmm. okay. Patrick, does this answer your question? It seems like. <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay, so I mark it as answered. Uh, next question by Ines. How and when does requirement engineering happen in your process? Um, that's good. Uh, that's, a good that's a really good question. Um, great question. Uh, so what I um, tend to see um, at Parkside is that uh, at some projects uh, we take uh, the business requirements um, and they go straight into the development backlog. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that happened to you as well, uh, but I think it's like uh, our job of like gatekeeping and say, okay, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> um, so it, it really depends on the, on the project, on, on the client. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, best thing, of course, would be as, as, as early on as possible um, to have like a uh, lot of time for, for uh, you know, uh, conception, uh, all of the design thinking processes uh, until we have, you know, these requirements then uh, transfer, uh, transferred into like a development backlog. Okay. Um, did this answer the question or do you have an additional question on this, Ines? Okay. Thank you. Then uh, Matthias asked, uh, how do you version control InDesign files or don't you have to do print design? Um, so since uh, a few months, we have a dedicated uh, a graphic design uh, person who works with our marketing department and uh, HR department. Um, so yes, we have to do print design, uh, but only for internal use. And that's like uh, manageable by uh, one, one designer. So we don't use version control for InDesign. I think currently there's also no um, real option for version controlling InDesign files, uh, as far as I know, but please correct me um, if I'm wrong. Uh, so we don't need to do that. And also um, the engagement with our clients uh, we really focus on software development and digital products. So, um, you know, um, maybe uh, if, if the client asks, then, then we do some, some print stuff on the side for them, but uh, that's not our focus. Okay, we heard lucky bastard. So <laughs> I, I think the uh, question was answered. <laughs> but I, I spent the first part of my career designing for print. Uh, so uh, I'm really, uh, I really like the, the process of it. Don't, don't get me wrong. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then finally, I also have uh, one question. You uh, presented at the atomic design. Um, is there a, any specific reason uh, why you chose uh, atomic, for example, over the uh, M uh, design method? There are different. Uh, and uh, additional Maybe. other systems that you could use, uh, but yeah. Um, I think it was like the, the um, how easy it was uh, to apply to our uh, projects. Um, but uh, maybe you can talk about like, uh, what do you think uh, are the benefits of uh, BEM over uh, atomic design? Uh, I'm, I'm curious. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, this was just like a perfect fit for us uh, in the beginning. So no, no specific reasons uh, as, as the one stated in the talk. Okay, so may maybe we can discuss it in the networking part afterwards, uh, after the second talk. And uh, while we are waiting for maybe some additional uh, questions, maybe someone has additional questions, I show you the outcome of the uh, design team collaboration. Uh, there's a lot uh, tendency to Adobe XD. Um, we also have uh, Balsamic here. We have uh, Figma, uh, Miro and Mural, almost the same. Um, I don't know if all of you know Mural and Miro. These are uh, some um, 
kind of uh, online whiteboards uh, specifically uh, designed for uh, collaboration for designers. You can also use sticky notes and so on. And um, I don't know why to prefer one over the other because uh, both are equally um, or, or match each other. We have a sketch here. Um, and uh, at least we have one person using a, a flip chart and a whiteboard and uh, a pen. So <laughs> still. Um, so maybe it's just like one one uh, thought. Um, as I said, like I think like the, like Sketch, Adobe, and, and, and Figma are like if you look at their features, they're nearly identity, at least to me. Um, uh, and also, like uh, Abstract, for example, opened up, um, I think, in a, in, a, in a beta version to support um, Adobe XD files as well. So if you want um, to have like a closer look at version controlling your design files, um, Adobe XD is now also possible uh, with Abstract. So maybe that's um, interesting for you. Um, Figma, um, yes, I know, has like a built-in um, version history, so it has like versioning, uh, but uh, it's it's not version control. So those are like two different things. Basically, um, if you think about version history, it's like I don't know if you like um, edit the Google Doc and you can go back in time, right? But you don't have like specifics of uh, many different branches who committed which changes uh, like exactly at what time, and you can revert back. Uh, easily, so it's not as powerful as, as version control. Um, so it, it it always depends on on I think your uh, personal and, and and team setup, uh, what you prefer, and there's no wrong or right. Um, for us, the combination of abstract and sketch is just right now the the perfect fit. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that input. Uh, have you considered using um, any cloud system like, for example, SharePoint, which have an uh, version control included in uh, their usage. Uh, you could use any of those files and just step back in time and have uh, your versioning from the cloud systems. Um, yes, but it's not like as visual as within abstract. So, um, you know, you have like um, the, the good thing about the Git workflow and maybe like a, a developer can like step in and explain it from a development point of view. It like it compares two versions uh, so two design files where, where two designers worked on the same thing, for example, and it tries to merge those uh, files, and it's really good at that. So basically, it like um, exports uh, or deconstructs your your design files into like a JSON format, uh, and looks for uh, um, you know what is similar and what what has been changed. Um, so you know if you try to merge something back to master, then it you know say, states hey. Uh, some designer changed stuff on this artboard. Uh, would you like to review it? Would you like to merge it? Uh, how would you like to um, uh, how would you like to proceed? Right. So it's like uh, really uh, a smart uh, tool for that. Okay. Great. Thank you. So um, I would suggest that uh, just to grab some fresh air or grab a new glass of wine or uh, another drink, maybe not for the people in the States because it's uh, early morning, maybe you, you take a uh, coffee or tea, um, which of one you would prefer. Um, but uh, first I will change our active poll to uh, our uh, break poll. And uh, I'm really interested because most of us are uh, doing their meetings from home in uh, video conferences. So uh, the question that we're talking about is, what's the strangest thing that you did while attending a meeting online? And I will hide the results until uh, the end of our break. So a 15 minutes break, and then we will be back here and uh, listen to the second talk by uh, Clemens Kupch um, or over uh, or about um, the uh, cognitive load. So uh, I'm here. Uh, if you have any questions or want to chat, just talk. You can also drop the line in uh, Slido questions. So yeah. OK, thank you. See you in a few minutes. See you in a few minutes.
So it's it's really great to have so many people uh, joining. Uh, usually the, the meetups are tending to have at least uh, a drop off from the uh, people who are are with repeat uh, for the meetup to one third. So I'm really glad that so many are here. And uh, as you can see, we have a real great uh, time here. And right now, still an awesome talk by Clemens. And the other one by Clemens uh, will be great as well. So, And I'll be back in a second. So if you have questions, drop in the chat. I will look at it afterwards. So uh, by the way, if you have anything uh, you want to share or get in touch and uh, have your own presentation here or want to host a meetup, you can get in touch with me. Here are my contact details. Uh, you can also contact me if you have uh, any questions. So don't be shy, um, just ask and I will try to provide you the best answer I can give you. So.
By the way, if you're wondering that there is only Netflix there, it's uh, also Amazon Prime or any other series or movie you watch. I might you have guessed that. So. So five minutes more of the break. Um, for all who are already here, I uh, show you the result that is um, currently available. And there are a lot of cooks out there. Any good recipe with toilet paper and noodles? Okay, <laughs> hopefully the ideas <laughs> won't crash your next meetings. Um, so <laughs> glad you enjoy the ideas. Any one of those who played video games uh, in meetings, what's good video games for uh, meetings? Do you have any ideas? Angry Burn. <laughs> you know that uh, Clemens is also here. I think it doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> so, and HR. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh Nina, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, uh, Nina, will you send out a meeting with parents? <laughs> <laughs> so glad that uh, my boss is not here. So. <laughs> But he might listen to the recording afterwards. So, and uh, do you take your uh, laptop or phone with you to the restroom? Just asking for a friend. I know all of the cool videos uh, that are shown on the different uh, TVs, as you see the the image that I chose here. <laughs> so. Any one of you on one of the videos going viral right now of the meetings? Don't be shy. The recording is still active, but we won't tell anyone. So. So just uh, one question to everyone. Um, are you already back? Maybe just drop a line in the chat. So uh, because 15 minutes break, uh, I know that we need a break, but 15 minutes uh, can be long if you're just alone at home. And <laughs> so. Yes, 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 back. So we'll wait, uh, I guess, three more minutes. In the meantime, anyone uh, who wants to uh, connect um, or present on their own, feel free to contact me on uh, 
via email um, or on Facebook, Twitter, Xing, and LinkedIn. Uh, maybe for uh, those who are joining from the United States don't know Xing, it's uh, similar to LinkedIn, but it's, uh, I don't know if it's only in German, but it's uh, mostly used in the uh, uh, German, Austrian, Switzerland area, and LinkedIn is the more international one, so. It's the oldest and best known ripoff of LinkedIn, I think. Yeah, uh, especially in, in our area here, but yeah. uh, it's uh, not that common for international contact. So, and I'm uh, more active on LinkedIn as well. So, and Only 17 people um, at the moment, but uh, I think we have kind of a winner and I think it's uh, enough to tell that most of the people cook during online meetings. Um, do you work from your kitchen? I I'm wondering because I, I couldn't cook, but it's... Uh, I'm just thinking about switching to the kitchen and cooking dinner for now. Uh, you just need a panini grill <laughs> next to your great idea. Yeah, that Perfect. Yeah. I'll, I'll, most of the time, I'll use my MacBook. I just it, it heats up so yeah, bad. Yeah, can get pretty <laughs> hot, right? Oh, just just scrambled eggs on the MacBook. Yeah, <laughs> that could work as well. I don't know if I uh, made it possible to answer multiple uh, things, but I guess so. And I'm really wondering why War Pajamas is not on 100%. I think some of you are still lying about what they did. No, when you think about it, like <laughs> pajamas make, just make you sleepy, so you don't want to wear it during the meeting. You know? Ah, good point. It makes, good point. You, makes you like lousy. <laughs> You know what, guys? Like, I, I, this is like the first time I put on like jeans in like seven weeks just for this talk. <laughs> Otherwise, I was just like in sweatpants all day. I was about to say that it's it's <laughs> pajamas or or jogging pants or sweatpants. Okay, like, so, right? so both of you should take the second uh, second turn and uh, a talk in four weeks again at the next meetup, so you have a reason to wear jeans again. I'm only wearing a shirt, by the way. It's just you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So <laughs> that's that's awesome. Final words for uh, for putting up uh, or, or closing the break right now. I hope everyone uh, has grabbed a drink. Yeah, and you have uh, tea, coffee. Uh, if it's still uh, since it's still morning or uh, yeah, Basically. not yet noon in the States, um, and all of the other ones uh, might have grabbed a drink. Uh, whiskey, I read in the chat, uh, uh, Clemens, you prepared with whiskey here, uh, and wine, the other Clemens, so cheers. So we're not allowed tea if we're in Austria, is it? It's uh, almost 8 p.m. in Austria, but we have people joining from the States and Costa Rica, so uh, I think it's... Uh, okay, now I feel excluded because I'm in Austria and I'm drinking tea right now. Yeah, tea is also great. Is I'm okay. only drinking juice, so it's fine. Okay. <laughs> I will I will grab my wine after I uh, the moderation ended. <laughs> so um, thanks for the input. Uh, again, I will hand over to Clemens. Second time to tonight. Um, so uh, say welcome to Clemens Kupch, um, who is uh, doing the uh, next. Uh, the next talk about uh, cognitive load. And uh, if you have any uh, any questions, uh, again, I will post the link to our uh, Q&A section in the chat. Just uh, drop your questions in our uh, Slido. And uh, welcome Clemens, also from Parkside. Um, don't wonder if the Clemens looks different from the Clemens before. So Clemens, the stage is yours. 
Thank you very much. I hope you all can see my first slide. Mm, that's good to hear. Looks great. Perfect. OK, so let's start with a short uh, introduction. Um, you already said, my name is Clemens as well. I'm Clemens Kupsch. I'm also working for Parkside um, for a bit more than 10 years now. So I'm with Parkside from the beginning. And before that, I was working as a freelancer back in the good old days when we still did Flash and there were no things like UX designers or UX researchers. Um, it was just web design. And that changed over the time. And since a couple of years, I'm focusing mostly on UX design. And at Parkside, currently, I'm the, the UX lead. So cognitive load. I'm sure many of you have already heard the term cognitive load. I mean, it regularly pops up in, in UX talks and discussions. Every now and then, a client might drop it, or you read about it in an article. And today, I want to shed some light on its background in cognitive psychology and also give you a better understanding of its history and where it comes from. And I also would like to encourage you to go beyond the usability guidelines to understanding their underlying reasoning. So it's not about using the term, throw it at someone. It's better to understand the whole underlying thing and get a better understanding and know how to, to use it properly. And there have been dozens of studies, test setups, whatever, being performed, many more models and theories um, that we're able to cover in a single talk without going into deep. And I already have to apologize to any psychologists that might be around tonight. I needed to simplify things a bit for this talk due to the mixed audience we have tonight. So let's start with a, a quick overview. I summed up today's topics. Um, we will start with a quick definition of the term cognitive load. We will then continue with memory models, what that means, a bit about the history here, as well as about attention. And the core element of the talk would be the cognitive load theory. Um, this is a learning um, a thing connected to, to learning theory. We will not cover the whole thing, but the thing that's mostly interesting for us as UX designers. And it will end the talk with some recommendations, a summary, and one or the other example for you to see how things apply in, in real life. Good, so let's start with a quick definition of what cognitive load is. I'm pretty sure every one of you have been confronted with situations um, that overwhelmed you could be in school when you tried to write notes, but your teacher talked too fast, for example. Or it might be that you, I don't know, visited a website that was so crowded with elements that you immediately left. You just closed it and were not interested in the content anymore. Or another example, you're driving in your car. If you have kids, for example, you're trying to have a conversation on the phone while your kids on the backseat yell around. So all that really is more or less applying to cognitive load. So let's come up with a more formal definition first. Cognitive load is the mental effort required to learn new information, which gets increased when unnecessary demands are imposed on a learner, making the task of processing information overly complex. Or simply put, it's the amount of info we bombard our mental processing system with at a, at a given time. And even if the simple version is easier to grasp, we already have some, some interesting keywords here in the formal version. We want to stick to that for a second. One is mental effort. That's a very important thing. New information, unnecessary demands, and processing information. Those things come together and need some further explanation. And we will later on hear a bit more about those aspects of, of cognitive load. But for now, I want to split it up into two main components which have a direct impact uh, on the cognitive load or the definition of the cognitive load. 
both play a vital role in understanding it. And I will start with memory first, but we also have attention. So let's start with memory right away. How is our memory set up? Well, so far, researchers and scientists came up with the following types of, of memory. Let's start here with sensory memory, the short-term memory, of course, long-term memory. But what does that mean? What should we understand um, under those, those terms? Well, here's some explanations to it. Sensory memory is everything that you perceive. When you see something, this information, for example, needs to get transported to your brain to be further processed. And until this happens, we're talking here about milliseconds, it needs to be stored somewhere. Think of it as a, a super limited buffer for each of your sensory inputs. Could be seeing things, feeling things, um, hearing um, things like auditory, auditory input. So that's all handled by sensory memory. Or it's also sometimes called sensory register, depending on which paper you're reading, uh, different terms for the same thing. Then we have short-term memory. And I'm sure you have heard of all those terms before, but it's good to clear those up a bit first. This term is used to be understood differently in the past. Nowadays, we use it to describe our ability to hold specific information for a little bit of time to be further manipulated. So it's not the manipulation. It's more or less like a store, but a bit. It's la it lasts a bit longer than the sensory memory. And then we have long-term memory. I think that's easy to understand. It, it should be pretty easy. Um, whenever you remember something from the past, your long-term memory is involved. It can hold a vast amount of information. And sometimes it even lasts for your whole life. But one is missing, and that's a very important one we will have a look today at. And that's working memory. That's the most interesting one. for us today. We'll learn a bit more about it in a minute. And it's important to understand that it's not storing like the short-term memory we just had before, but rather used to manipulate bits of information. Nonetheless, every now and then, it gets confused with short-term memory um, every now and then. So how do we know about those memory types? Were they discovered in a, in a specific location of our brain or something? How did we came up with it? Well. We have to understand that we are dealing with models here. It's like a concept of how our thinking is organized. And that's why those concepts have been adopted over time and can only show a current understanding. It might change in the future again. But that's what we have nowadays. And it's a very good, um, they, they represent very good models to explain what we can. Um, what we can see in real life situations. They don't refer to a specific spot in or areas in our brain, but there are some neuroanatomical correlates they have found recently due to, to uh, neuroimaging. If we think about the time when those things were discovered, we would have to go back, way back in time until, for example, ancient uh, Greece, even in, in, in those times, uh, Aristotle, for example, he already uh, made observations about our memory and how it was set up. But it wasn't until the 1950s before someone researched a very interesting fact. Some of you might have heard of it. And it's the, the magical number 7 plus or minus 2. And I'm sure some of us have already heard of it, especially if you, for example, worked with Scrum. Chances are high that you, that you did. Yes, that's George Miller. He was the guy who came up with it after some research he did in 1956 in regards of short-term memory capacity. And the paper he, he, um, um, he wrote is nowadays one of the, the most highly cited papers in psychology, not only in psychology, also in regards to, to UX, to user experience. And Therefore, it's important for us to know it and to understand it. But what does it say? Well, in short, 
it says that the number of objects an, an average person can hold in short-term memory is about seven. And the plus minus two is only referring to interpersonal differences. So basically what it says is our capacities are limited. So seven plus minus two, that's also known as, as Miller's law. And many people think this refers only to seven items, numbers or words. Um, but it's important to understand that the results here differ in regards of the type of, of element you're trying to uh, keep in your mind. And also there are things that um, kind of let Miller adopt his theory after a while and he came up with the concept of chunks. We will hear about it a bit later on. A chunk is a, a collection of basic familiar units that have been grouped together and stored in a person's memory. And chunking is something that you do on a, on a daily basis. I will show that to you later on. We will do some real life examples about it. But let's start with Miller's law first. What do you think? Shall we test those claims? I think that's a good idea. I will show you some, um, some numbers. I will make sure that you understand that Miller's law is a real thing it also applies to to each of us so we'll read some numbers to you and see if, you, if you're capable of, of remembering them in the right order so i will read some numbers to you we we'll begin with a shorter number and then they will get longer and we will try to remember those are you ready okay i will start with the first one Try to remember it, it's just for yourself and see how far you can get. Seven, eight, three. That was super easy, right? Seven, eight, three, just three numbers. Let's add two more digits. Nine, one, three, six, Two. Can you remember those? Still easy to remember, right? Nine, one, three, six, two. But let's add two more so that we have those seven digits, the seven uh, we already heard about uh, in, in Miller's law. Three, eight, four, seven, one, zero, Five. Can you remember it? Well, I guess it's starting to get tricky for some of you, maybe. No? Can handle some more? Those were the numbers, by the way. But let's add some more. Eight, three, seven, six, two, five, one, Four, two, nine, four, one. Are you able to recall the number? Well, I guess it was nearly impossible, at least for me, that would be the case. And as you can see, it's getting harder and harder to remember those numbers in a correct order, the longer they get. And some of you, of course, might be able to remember up to nine or even 10 of those digits. Um, that's due to those differences, those uh, differences between people. But in a bigger sample, we would see that what we're getting is more or less a normal distribution towards the number seven. And the plus minus two is referring exactly to that, those differences, those interpersonal differences. So what can we say? We just tested our, our mental uh, capability to keep numbers in our mind, our short-term memory. And we saw that limited capacity is really effective. And results are following a normal distribution. Carl, it's really hours to do a good job for your client. They don't really understand what took so long and why it's so expensive. Okay, and then you feel angry and dejected, and Remember you say, you know, thank you. 
Okay, by the way, it would be equally hard to perform the task with letters. We might be able to write down approximately seven of those letters in correct order. So again, seven plus minus two here is a basic rule. We can even give it a try. We look at those for, I don't know, 30 seconds, and you take a piece of paper and try to write down uh, the characters in the correct order, you would see that you um, will have more or less seven of those uh, in the right order. But what about chunking? I mentioned it before. We said that a chunk is a, a collection of those basic familiar units that have been grouped together. And how does that apply? Well, we learned that more than seven characters, those are hard to remember. The longer the numbers or characters get in a list, the harder they will be to remember. Oops, sorry. Okay, I was missing a slide here. Sorry for that. So, what if I present those 13 characters to you? Just look at it for a minute and then try to remember them in the right order. Okay, I'm going to cover them. Would you be able to remember the characters? I'm sure some of you would be able to do that. Why is it so easy to remember those 13 characters, or at least more easy than before? Well, because we can pack those 13 characters into three chunks, or words. That's the same thing. And that's a common thing for us to do, and we could even go further, we could expand the whole concept of chunking. Have a look at the list um, of words. Would you be able to remember all of those words? So if I show those words to you, you can read through them once, and then I would cover it. You think you would be able to remember all of those words? Well, the same limit applies as before. Usually, it's around seven um, plus minus two, you could be able to remember. But what if we chunk them and build new groups out of those words and call them sentences? We would also be able to remember those. For example, here I highlighted some of them. And this, again, is a very personal thing. So it could be different for every one of you. But here we could build a sentence like, um, seven little black cats sit in a treehouse at the ocean and make big noise. So we chunked all those words into one sentence and we would be able to remember them, even in the right order. Um, I think it's clear that chunking has its limits. No one can chunk sentences into chapters and chapters into books and so on. But nonetheless, we're using this technique on a, on a daily basis when we try to remember phone numbers or even the route to a specific location. Interestingly, if we hear, um, for example, a sound like uh, single notes, in our brain we combine those to a little melody, and that makes it much easier for us to remember. So there's a, um, a situation in which we remember auditive inputs much easier than things we would see, for example, on a display or on a screen. So from the 50s to the 70s, this model was an accepted model to explain cognitive processes, the one Miller came up with. And on the other hand, some issues were just spread out because it was not possible to explain some issues they had or problems they had with Miller's concepts he came up with. So it needed an update. And then came Badley and his working memory model. This was in 1974. And as for now, we learned about the limitations of our short-term memory, which only stands for our ability to hold the information available. But back then, a concept such as a working memory didn't even exist. So if you want to understand how we manipulate data in our brain, and that's important to understand cognitive load, 
we need to learn a bit about Badley's work and how it added to Miller's findings. A working memory, as we said before, helps us to tie information together, the information we stored in our short-term memory. And this information we have there also needs to rely on information we already have in our long-term memory. For example, we would not be able to chunk those characters into single words if we don't know the words. And those words are stored in a long-term memory. So there's a connection between those memory types. Another example would be um, it's easy to remember some numbers, like 7,203 and the number 962. But if I would ask you to multiply those two numbers, it would get much more difficult, I guess. Or as an example, a vacation trip. You have several suitcases all around you, and you're wondering how would those fit into the trunk of my car? And you look at them, and in your mind, you're trying to fit them into the trunk. That's called mental rotation. That's also something done with your working memory. Those examples should give you more or less an idea of what your working memory is all about. Good. Let's have a look at Batley's working memory model. In 1971, Batley, together with, with Graham Hitch, came up with four core elements, which, according to them, would be needed to have our working memory up and running. And as I don't want to dive too deep into this topic, I will just give you a very brief introduction into those terms and the co concepts behind them. Um, if someone is interested in it, you can look it up on Wikipedia. There are plenty of articles on the internet about it. It's very interesting to read through it. But for now, as you can see, sensory information comes in on one side, that's on the left side. It could be visual, auditory, somatosensory, whatever, and enters the working memory process. That's the thing in the center here. We have something called the central, and it serves a bit as a master and a coordinator, uh, whereas the other three in our diagram are sub or slave systems. And those can interact and will interact, of course, with your long-term memory. That's why we have uh, the arrows going in two directions here. So we have the visual spatial sketch pad, um, the phonological loop, and the episodic buffer. I will just give you a very quick introduction. Visual spatial sketch pad, that deals with visual and spatial information. It's important if we want to keep track of where we are in relation to other objects, for example, or if we're um, looking at images, whatever. We have the phonological loop. And as the name already, I think it gives you an idea, um, refers to auditory input. It helps us to deal with spoken language, information we get from speech, as well as written material. And the episodic buffer, that was added by Batley a bit later on, as he wasn't able to explain everything with those two types only. And it's thought of as a system that more or less integrate those two like visual, spatial, and verbal information before it gets uh, processed in a long-term memory. So that's it for now for Badly's working memory model. I don't want to go any deeper, but one important thing is that working memory is like a multi-part system. That's the core idea of Badly's working memory model. So there are different components, and each component is responsible of a different function or domain and it also has its own limitations. As we heard before, auditive inputs are handled differently from, from visual ones, for example. Good. Oh, no, another one. Embedded processing model of working memory. I know you might still be thinking about the other model. And no worries, I won't bother you with any details on this model. But it's important to know that there's another one. Um, came out in 1999 after some intense research, Cohen did. And it's interesting for us because it added another ingredient to the whole um, understanding of how our working memory and our mental capacity 
is set up, and that's attention. There are several very complex models to explain selective attention, and they could all be discussed in a talk of its own. It would take maybe a couple of hours or even several talks to go through all of them and explain the, uh, the different ways they work and they understand attention and they try to explain um, what we can see in real life. So I decided to rather sum up some general claims for you that we can make about attention. And they should be sufficient to get the whole idea um, through of how our learning processes happen. And as a simple example, if we think of those memory models we had before, if we think of them just like a house in which things happen and get processed, then attention is the gate in front of that house. It's even more like that. It acts a bit like a, a bouncer or an agent that can also kick out things uh, if they get too complicated or other things get more important. That's what we call distraction. We would be interested in other topics from one moment to the other. And here are some, some quick and easy findings in regards of attention that sum, sum all the things up. For example, attention helps us to separate the essential stimulus. Could be that it's something we are willfully doing. We want to focus on, I don't know, our homework, our studies, whatever, and separate it from the surrounding noise. So sometimes we, let's say you start to um, get into learning material and you're sitting in a restaurant. There's noise around you. You can, you can start um, getting into your, your learning material, and you would not even hear things around you. You can fade those out. So that's one way of our mind to separate the essential stimulus from the surrounding noise. Attention is also the bottleneck of our cognitive uh, capabilities. So if we're not um, focusing attention to something or attention is brought to something, we cannot process it. It's, it, it will not make it through to our, to our um, to the parts of our brain that process information. And I already said it, um, the counterpart of attention is distraction. That's something we want to avoid if we're thinking UX terms, if we want to set up a website, an app. Um, you could get even further if you plan, I don't know, an airport and you want to get a person from one point to the other, like to his gate or something. You want to reduce distraction. You want to keep him focused on his, on his task he tried to fulfill right now. Some more interesting facts. Attention is mostly happening in an automated way. So we do um, focus our attention willfully, but that's only 0.0036% uh, of our mental processes that are kicked off by willful decisions. And the act of willfully focusing our attention is resource intense. That's also very important because when, whenever we distract a person from what we want him to achieve, let's say on a website, and we need to get him back in focus, that's a very resource intense thing for him to do. And that's why he might feel uncomfortable because he, he, he feels that tension that oh, I have to focus again, I have to put effort into my concentration, into my focusing uh, abilities again. And that's something we want to avoid. Good, and now we come to the core element of this um, talk, and that's cognitive load theory. All we heard before is, is just the preparation to get us set up to understand cognitive load theory and what's happened there. It's a theory that emphasizes instructional design. So, for example, if you're a teacher in a school and you're preparing learning materials for your students, Cognitive load theory is something you should definitely have in mind and follow through um, the known effects and the guidelines you would find in there. But it's also beneficial for us as UX designers and it helps us to understand what's needed to present information in a, in a proper way, in a good way, in an optimal way to transport it to the user or to help him to make proper decisions or the decisions we want him to make. So, how does it look? Whenever someone needs to learn something, 
he makes use of attention and memory capacities. Those are the two things we had in the beginning, memory and attention. We need both of them. So we try to get sensory input, could be learning materials, some sort of communication we listen to, any type of external information through this narrow, tiny pipe of working memory um, to enable decision making or add something to a long term memory. It's like getting one thing to the other side, from one side to the other, and we have to go through that really narrow tunnel um, to transport it to the other side. The amount of information we're trying to get through this funnel is called cognitive load. It's like the load a truck can hold and needs to transport something from A to B. It could be bricks, for example, or I don't know, concrete, or whatever you want to transport. Whatever the, the, the truck can hold, that's cognitive load, more or less, in this uh, parable. But keep in mind, it's, it's, it's not only something static like the, the truck implies, where you could put something in and it will stay the same forever. Attention is also involved, and it, it's permanently looking for new things that might be of interest for you or that might be more interesting or uh, more beneficial for you. So, for example, you can be focused in your studies, but if you would hear an alarm signal, you would turn around your head. So the truck is emptied and filled with something else. So we need to keep attention um, in mind as well here. Good, let's have a closer look. Um, cognitive load theory postulates three different types of load. And it's not one or the other, it's always all three of them, as they represent different aspects of the information we want to process or transport from A to B. Let's go through them one by one. The intrinsic cognitive load, um, it describes the inherent level of difficulty or the complexity of a task. And it cannot be altered um, by the way it's presented or explained. In the end, the intrinsic load is the exact information that will later on be stored in your long-term memory. And it should be clear that there's a difference in cognitive load between a simple addition, like you can see here, 2 plus 2, or a complex equation, as you can see it. The information might get split up into smaller pieces or packs, but in the end, what you store in your long-term memory is always the understanding of that intrinsic cognitive load. So if you want to understand or explain um, this complex equation, you cannot just get rid of a part of it. You need to keep the whole thing in your mind and you need to understand it. And that's meant by intrinsic load. So there's not much we can change about it. The extraneous cognitive load, um, that's the manner in which information is presented. Um, it's, it's defining this load, and the more distractions, the higher the extraneous load, uh, as it adds unnecessary demands or information or processing time. And the germane cognitive load, this is the load we, we want to, um, we really want to get into the focus. It's defined by the learning strategies and the way we process information and construct relevant schemas or categories. Um, by the way, schemas here, they can be understood as patterns of thought that organize information and the relationships among them. For example, we, if we take the, um, the two plus two example from the intrinsic um, load, the two numbers are one schema, the plus is a schema. We need to understand how we add those up to get to a, a result. For example, we not need to know, okay, we have to keep both numbers in mind, then I have to add them, I have to have a concept, how to add numbers, things like that. Those are schemas. And if we want to oversimplify again, we could sum those things up as intrinsic load refers to the complexity of the content, we cannot change much about it. That's a given thing. Extraneous cognitive load refers to the complexity of the presentation or the way the content gets presented. Um, that's something we have control over. And the germane cognitive load is the effort we spend on understanding the content. So three different things we need to keep in mind. 
And according to this, we can derive some clear directives. Let's have a look at the next slide. We cannot reduce the intrinsic load. We can only split it up, maybe. That would mean that we have a smaller piece of information we need to process. But in the end, uh, if we have a complex thing we need to learn or we want to remember, in the end, we need to transport all of those um, intrinsic elements. But we have to reduce the extraneous load. We have to reduce the noise, the things that are not necessary to transport this information. By this, we free capacity for the germane cognitive load, the process of learning. And that leads to a very important thing. Whenever we create or organize content for a user, we should reduce the extraneous load to a minimum to free capacity for the germane cognitive load. It's more or less a fine tune or balancing out those different types of load and come up with an optimized way of presenting information. And we want to support meaningful cognitive load. Some people think that cognitive load is something we want to avoid at any cost. That's not true. Cognitive load is a good thing and a normal thing for us as human beings. It's just about what type of load we, we load or we, we, uh, we add as a burden to the user. And there we can be smarter and make use of cognitive load view. So how to avoid that? Well, there are some basic recommendations I can give you. They are seen here on that next slide. First one would be to split complex tasks into less complex ones. And this refers to the intrinsic cognitive load. It's true that we can change this load, as we said before, but we can split it up. And for example, if, we're, if we keep that, um, that example with the truck and, for example, the bricks, if we want to build a house and therefore need to get five tons of bricks from A to B, we would usually not do that in one big load. We would do it bit by bit. So the total amount of bricks you transport will not change, but the amount of bricks you transport at a given time, that's something we could control. So we would split it up in batches and reduce the workload here. We want to reduce the noise. Noise is everything that distracts the user and his attention away from the essential information we want to transport. It's not only information, sometimes it's also an action he should perform. Um, so it's more referring to decision making and less to keeping things in your long term memory. Therefore, we want to avoid visual clutter in any form, maybe irrelevant images or design elements. Um, redundant links, needless text, meaningless typography choices, whatever. Important things should be as salient as possible. That's the, the core um, learning here. We need to understand existing mental models. What does that mean? Well, taking in consideration what your users know and what they expect. If their concepts of reality get violated by your presentation, you force them to re-evaluate their models. And that's a very uncomfortable task as it uses up a lot of energy. There have been plenty of experiments done by psychologists, very interesting things like, um, I don't know, uh, presenting an image of a red apple and underneath you have the textual information, green apple. That's something that needs some sort of, of uh, mental energy from you to process it. Like, hey, wait a second, there's a red apple? Why is green apple written underneath? There's a mismatch between two, those two things. So it's violating our perception of, of reality. And that's something that's very uncomfortable for most uh, people. Last but not least, and by the way, the list could go, go on for, for quite some time, but the, the last one on my list is get familiar with known effects. Researchers found a set of common effects in learning situations, and we should consider them on a regular basis as they help us to identify those possible problems a user may be confronted with. Similar to heuristic evaluations where you go through a list one by one, 
You can do the same thing with uh, cognitive load theory. There are effects. Uh, you can find them on the internet. You can Google them. And it's always good to have an eye on those. Good. Let's sum up really quickly what we learned today. We have a limited capacity of 7 plus minus 2. For the ones that are more rooted in psychology, it's true. There's new research that even reduces that amount to be said like 4 plus minus 2. Really depends on the situation and what type of test you're performing. We learned about working memory, that such a thing exists, or at least a concept of such a thing exists. We need to manipulate information in our brain, not only store it. We heard about the role of attention, that we easily get attract, um, distracted, and that attention should be as focused as possible for our users so that they can fulfill the tasks or whatever we try to um, try to transport on our website, maybe information, maybe a task they should perform, whatever. We learned, and that's a very important thing, that there are different types of cognitive load. So those three types, one we cannot change, one we need to get uh, down, that's the extraneous cognitive load, one we want to enforce, and that's the germane cognitive load, so the process of understanding um, the things we want to learn. And, and that's a very important thing, it's all based on scientific research. It's, it's not just some sort of uh, thing someone came up with and like, hey, let's call something cognitive load and maybe that's too much information for someone to process. And why I um, highlight that, that piece of information is whenever we talk to clients, we have to make clear that the things we're doing in user experience are evidence-based. They are based on research. They are based on scientific research, hopefully, and not um, just assumptions we make uh, without any good reason. Good. Um, that's it from the theoretical side. Um, but I would love to show you two of those common effects in action, if you will to continue for another five minutes. The split attention effect. Well, what's that? Um, for example, labels and notes about a diagram or image placed at a distance from it cause extraneous load. We have scarce working memory capacities and it's wasted by moving one from the other. We have to make those connections again and that's a, a, a resource-intense process. And let me give you an example. Here we see a, a schematic illustration of the human eye and the names of its elements. I'm sure you can recognize how your eyes is, eye is going forth and back to address the correct label to the elements you see. And you might even find it uncomfortable to go forth and back. Why is that? Because, for example, you look at number one, the correct layer. Oh, okay, on the left side you find number one. Let's continue. You go back to number two, the cornea. You expect it to be closer to number one, because that's what's usually happening, and it happens on the right side. Everything is in order. That's, by the way, an example of how our presentation, our uh, representation is clashing with um, our mental model, that things are in, a, in, a, in the right order. So we would need to look for the number two and maybe take some time to find it. Okay, we found it. Then we have to go back to the list again. So you can, you can really see in which direction the whole thing is going. But what if we set up the illustration slightly different? Much better, right? It's interesting that this effect isn't limited to spatial parameters only. Whenever we present different elements of the same concept, we need to make sure that those are as close as possible and do not force our user to go forth and back in his mind. So it's spatially and conceptually. And this also applies to menu items, for example. And the common technique to avoid conceptual split attention is card sorting, in which similar elements get grouped together by um, a sample of, of users, for example. That's a way of 
making sure that we meet the mental models of our users and that things that belong together are represented together. Good. Um, let's have a look at another one. The redundancy effect. The redundancy effect occurs when information that includes redundant material results in less learning than the same information minus the redundant material. So here, extraneous cognitive load also gets increased if we present information in a redundant way. For example, please carefully look at the next slide and try to come up with an explanation of what's happening there. Are you ready? Pretty obvious, right? Were those descriptions underneath the images helpful for you? I guess not. I mean, the text is only describing something you can easily see in the pictures anyway. So no extra information was transported, but instead we increased our cognitive load, as you surely read through those texts, because you thought there's something um, helpful in there, or some information you would not um, only get by looking at the images, but that was not the case. So in, 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 in this case, we could get rid of all the text here and just let the image speak for itself. That's an example for uh, the redundancy effect. I could show you really quickly a real life example of both effects in action. Um, I have to explain a little bit. Here, this is an app we reviewed some time ago. A client of us um, used that app or came up with that app, and he asked us for a review. It's, I'm sorry, it's in German, so for the ones uh, that are, um, the mother tongue is English, I can give you a quick explanation. It's for patients, and they have to document their symptoms on a daily basis. So what you see here is a slider, and on top you have the type of symptom and if you move the slider the number in here will change and also every now and then the definition here of the symptom will change so those three uh, screenshots they show different moments in time while the person moved that slider down there i'll give you a moment let's see if you can identify some of the issues here. Okay, let's see if you've found some of them, or well, maybe all. <laughs> we have the split attention effect in action. In one case, that's the relation between the slider position and the numeric value. So whenever the user is moving the slider, he also has to keep the, the numeric uh, output here, the numeric value in mind. And that's something where his attention might be split. Also, the relation between the numeric value and the verbal description. Um, in a minute, we will hear why this is due to, it's not a, a spatial um, split attention effect, it's more of a conceptual, I will talk about it in a minute. But we also have the redundancy effect, the relation between his symptoms, so the thing he feels, and the numeric value, as well as the description. So we have to make or, or bring those three elements into a logical order. How bad am I feeling? How does that re refer to a, a numeric value? What is the description saying? So does the description and the numeric number both need to be here, or would the numeric uh, value be enough or the description would be enough. That's an example of the redundancy effect. Additional extraneous cognitive load is also added by the position of the finger and the motoric effort to use the slider. So while he's trying to hit that, I don't know, uh, perfect number five, because he thinks five is a, a, a good value to describe the pain he's uh, currently feeling, he would have a hard time to, to hit it because of the motoric effort here. 
you have to compare already seen descriptions with your current symptoms because um, let me go back one slide. Here you can see as long as we um, have the numeric value of three, we have one definition or one description. And as soon as we get into the area of four, 4.1, 4.2, this definition changes. But those are descriptions of, for example, pain or well-being or any type of, of form that a uh, symptom could have. So you have to keep in mind what you just read before. That adds to the extraneous load. And, and that's what I just mentioned before uh, for the split attention effect in a, in a more conceptual way. Um, the fact that a change in the numeric value only changes the description under certain circumstances, certain circumstances. Once again, I go back. Um, that was a bit of a mess here in this app as it was set up um, initially, because the definition only changes every full two steps in this uh, numeric values. So that's something the user has to understand and has to process before he can use that app. And I'm sure you can find even more of those and there were plenty of other things in here we, we were able to identify. But just to give you a quick example of uh, how things would work out in real life as a UX designer, if we apply um, those known effects of cognitive load theory. Okay, that was it from my side. I hope you learned a thing or two or understood it better. And I hope it was helpful for you in your daily work as a UX designer. And yeah, I'm looking forward to your feedback and maybe some questions. Thank you, Clemens, for this uh, wonderful, great talk and a uh, really great topic. So uh, thank you again. Uh, I posted the link again. Yeah, Connie, <laughs> start the applause. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, awesome input. So uh, I posted the link to the uh, questions again. I also started our uh, feedback uh, poll. Um, so uh, I would appreciate some feedback. I'm just talking a little bit in between until the first questions come up. Um, thanks also for this practical example in the end of your talk. Um, I was preparing a question uh, for uh, maybe you could give an example from practice, but uh, you brought it in the end, so thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, any questions up to now? Oh, people haven't been too bored. We're down to 15, 14. Oh, no, 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 numbers are dropping. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because uh, it's uh, the second talk and yes, uh, and sometimes it's uh, counting up and down because of the internet connection. So yeah. <laughs> don't worry about that. Um, uh, by the way, um, if you're interested in uh, cognitive load, maybe uh, Martina, uh, also joined us uh, is also here and maybe she can also explain uh, a few things on uh, cognitive load. Uh, she's uh, deep into UX psychology. Hello Martina. Hey Johannes. Hi, where <laughs> are you joining us from today? From Berlin, still in Berlin, uh, locked in Berlin. Thanks Clemens and Clemens guys, great presentations. Thank you very much and thanks Johannes for the organization and thank you for pulling me up here i'm not camera ready <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't uh, matter uh but maybe uh clemens uh you can connect to each other and uh, i have a question for clemens actually so it's actually great that you mentioned me because i it's a kind of a longer question to type uh for clemens Kupsch, maybe i should clarify yeah <laughs> Clemens, hey, you did mention that people do often uh misunderstand working memory as short-term memory yeah. I have to admit, I must be one of these people because I do consider it as a part of it. Can you elaborate a bit more here? And thanks so much for all the resources and theories. Man, I have a whole month to read now because of you. Yes. Um, I think that's due to the fact that you have to look at the, at the model you're trying to explain first. So it's really depending on which model you're trying to use to explain something you um, you, 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 um, you're exploring or you're looking at. 
For example, in, um, give me a second, in the second one I mentioned, the second um, model, that's the embedded processing model of working memory by Cohen. The concept is a different one. It's, for example, and that's where we would go deeper if we're talking about psychology here. Um, it's more a functional model than a, um, a static one. It's like you have the long-term memory and you don't have a concept like working memory here. It's like different areas of your long-term memory gets attention and gets um, in a status of being active and your attention is highlighting a couple of those to make connections between those. So that's a completely different model there. And there are different ones and different explanations. It's just that short-term memory and working memory, historically seen as far as I know, and I could be wrong, um, there's a differentiation between those. One is more of a static concept of keeping things, and the other one is more of a um, that concept of processing things, of manipulating them, like, I don't know, doing a multiplication with two numbers, something like that. Yeah. Indeed, I think it depends on the model, to be honest, because yeah. I do consider, indeed, part uh, of the short-term memory as a processing memory, because that's where you um, where, when the hippocampus activates, we get a yeah. bit neuro here, guys. Uh, the structure in the brain, which is um, pretty much responsible for um, processing memories and uh, forwarding them to the long-term memory for the ones who don't know. So the moment the hippocampus activates is actually within a minute, which is already for um, kind of responsible for that processing. However, when we talk about the recall, this is where just the long-term memory is activated. Patient HM, right. Right. <laughs> Don't ask me for names for models right now, because you are much better than me there. I think from the model you mentioned, I just remember the year. Was it the 1999 one? Yes. <laughs> yeah, see? That's how my brain works. <laughs> <laughs> Right, yeah. I mean, the thing you mentioned is is a really interesting one because that's more or less due to, I think, the, 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 the site you're looking at, or the, the site from which you're looking at the whole topic. And that's the more neuroanatomical one. So if you have uh, lesions in, in those areas, those hippocampal areas, you would have problems um, building new memories, for example, not recalling things, but kind of exactly transporting new information towards your long-term memory. Which then, uh, don't, Clemens, sorry to jump in, then it impacts your short-term memory, though, right? Yeah, it's not considered true. a long-term memory disorder, yeah. but the processing part of the short-term memory. But I'm not sure... I'm not sure if that necessarily means that the model is not covering that case. I would have to think about it a bit or research a bit about it. But that's an interesting thing, yeah. Yeah, and now we got to talk more than uh, making people here faint. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can discuss it in, uh, next, in one of our next meetups and make this a uh, topic. Uh, if one of you or you together want to uh, present this or discuss this. You know, I'm, I'm always up for that, you know, Johanna, so I'm like, as much as I can hear <laughs> you guys here, I can talk for ages about uh, psychology and the connection to UX as well. Um, and I will be trying to travel in a couple of weeks and we'll be then stuck in quarantine. So if you happen to organize another meetup in the next uh, three, four weeks, I mean... <laughs> we will definitely have... Anywhere, anyway, so yeah so perfect uh but we got uh two questions in our q a section so uh patrick asks uh you mentioned the slider app uh with the pain symptoms uh do you have a slide where you uh can show uh how this uh, where you solve this issue or uh where this issue was solved um no i don't have a slide and i'm not allowed to show you anything we came up with but i can tell you 
we removed the slider completely. And that's due to the fact that it's um, an element of direct manipulation, which especially on a mobile phone is not a very smart thing to do. Um, it, it's, it's used to hit a specific value usually. So if you, let's say, have you want to hit the, the value 4.8, it's really hard to hit it. So on a small device, um, a little bit of movement with your finger would end you up at 5.2 or 4.6. And that takes a lot of effort. This um, app is used mostly by people 65 years and older. So they're having issues using that app anyway, so we don't want it to add an, an, an extra element of confusion or, or making it harder for them to use it. Mm -hmm. Does I that hope. answer your question? Seems so. That was a thanks. Okay. <laughs> yes. And I also guess this uh, also answers the follow up questions uh, from Ozan. I hope I spelled it right. Um, as a follow up, what uh, are the solutions to the issue? At the example that you said, and you mentioned that you removed the slider completely. Was it right? Yes. Okay. So uh, I think both uh, uh, can be marked as uh, answered. But we well, have. I, an, can, I can add a bit to that. Um, of course, you okay. need to have an alternative way of entering the symptoms then. And typing in a value is also not an optimal thing. So first off, um, it wasn't only the numeric value that caused the problem. It was the amount of steps you could have in here. If you have a decimal number here, it's like 4.8 or 4.9, you would end up with um, on a scale from zero to 10, this was, I think, yes, you would end up with 100 options. And you can easily say that that's too much for every user, for any user to, any given user to um, kind of sort his, his, uh, his symptom or his pain or whatever, put it into that exact spot where, how he feels. So we reduced it down to um, five, more or less, it's it's similar to what you show kids in in the in the hospital. Um, for example, four or five uh, little smileys or emoticons, something like that. Or you can do it with numeric values. That's fine as well, as long as they understand um, which value means what. Zero does that mean no pain, and five is that horrible pain, or is it just pain, or is it pain that I would like to immediately kill myself. So you have to find a context for them that they are able to take their own perception and transform it into that abstract model and enter it to the system. It was another good comment uh, in the comment section in the chat. Uh, and you can't even you uh, really tell if the pain is 4.5 or 4.6. Exactly. It gives the so. impression that it's a metric value, which it isn't because um, if, if we want to really have metric um, values here, it would need to be something like, I don't know, your heart rate, you could measure. That's not something you really can measure. And if I enter a 4.5 two weeks ago and a 4.5 today, that doesn't necessarily mean that the um, amount of pain is the same today or two weeks ago. Hey, thank you. So uh, another question by Ozan, uh, also about the uh, germane uh, cognitive load. Uh, does that mean that the design should be following the already learned path for presenting the information as much as possible? I think it's uh, somehow about uh, already learned design, but uh, maybe you can answer that better than me. I'm not sure if I understand it right. So please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here. If you mean that the user has a mental model or is used to some sort of the, the presentation of some sort of information, then yes, we should follow it. That's why we do research and that's why we try to find our target group or um, the people we try to approach with our product or the website um, or, the app or whatever. Can I, can I maybe add something on this one? Yeah, please. Uh, what I meant was something like, let's say if you are a Windows user, you have a like a way of using the, like the, the frame yeah. or the comment. So this is already learned that you don't really think and do. Absolutely. So that's what I meant with this 
German load kind of is that what it is? Um, if you're a first time Windows user, yes, then the germane load is the the process of understanding how Windows works. If you're now going to a Mac or to a Linux system you have never used before, that would that would ask a lot of germane or would add a lot of germane cognitive load to you because you need to process how things work in this environment. As soon as you have learned it, you rely on your long-term memory and process memory or whatever. So then it's just when you're in an environment, follow up what is already learned and don't overload the user. Use the scanner. Right, again. So does it go like uh, if there is a already standardized way in the system, just follow that system and don't overload the user? Yes, That's what I would say so, yes. OK. Mm -hmm. I would also break it down to a simplified uh, version, for example, uh, comparing Windows to uh, Mac, uh, the OK and Cancel button, which is usually always the other way around, uh, depending on what system you're used to. So that's uh, one simple um, thing that you learn and you get used to very fast. So the germane, germane cognitive load is the, the, the process of learning something new. Yeah, well, so if, if you switch system, you is have the to way relearn it. Present it. So it could be that you present it in a very difficult way. Like uh, if you have a manual for, I don't know, an electric device, and it's 12 pages long, and there are no illustrations in there, that's, that's adding an, a tremendous amount of, of, of extraneous cognitive load. Just, and, and that means that you have less space for your germane cognitive load. So you have to go forth and back and split it up by yourself into small pieces and trying to solve the issue. And that and I mentioned that in the talk, that's very energy consuming. And your brain is that organ in your body that uses up the, the most energy in relation to, the, to its size. So therefore, it's, it, you're feeling uncomfortable, physically uncomfortable. Thank you. Um, I hope that was enough uh, otherwise you can ask again uh, in the uh, networking session afterwards and we have a D question here um, I, I think this is uh, not only about your talk but also about any other talk and uh, something that uh, a lot of people want to know um, but uh, now to you since it's in your Q&A section do you have anything that you consider the resource for beginners or hobbyists to learn uh, UX Yes. Um, go to the website of Nielsen Norman Group. You will find plenty of information there. Um, it's free. Um, you get it in written form. You have videos there. Um, they cover plenty of topics, and they also give you um, all the psychological background if you're really interested in understanding it in depth. Yeah, there's the uh, link already posted in the chat. Um, I also add here, uh, go and talk to other people, for example, join meetups like uh, this one and uh, ask questions and talk to the people. Uh, you can learn a lot, uh, even if you're into UX already and are not uh, someone who uh, says about uh, him or herself uh, to be a beginner or hobbyist. Um, you can still learn. Learning is a process that never ends, and uh, especially in UX, it's important to ask people and talk to them. That's uh, one thing that uh, you learn very quickly uh, because it's uh, one of the essentials, uh, essential parts of UX. I hope you agree as well. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, the human resource is also one important resource that uh, you always have to uh, keep in mind. Does this answer your question, Filippo? Yeah, um, uh, for now, uh, most of the meetups are uh, most of the meetups are online, so you can join a lot of more meetups right now, even if you don't live in larger cities and don't have to travel that much. So good. Uh, any additional questions? If uh, not, um, I um, 
I want you to uh, keep in mind that uh, we have still open the ideas section. I keep it open uh, a little bit longer, not only for the meetup. So just post your ideas or vote them up in talks and topics that you are interested in. Um, uh, I will try to find uh, speakers and talk to people again um, who might uh, put up their ideas, uh, who might show them uh, to us. Um, Okay, I, I will come back to the question again uh, uh, afterwards. So put up uh, your ideas, what you're interested in, what you want to be shared here. And uh, I also started the uh, poll for uh, rating this meetup. Uh, we really want to learn and uh, improve everything. So if you have ideas, just uh, drop them as a comment. I put up one comment. Um, I appreciate any comment and about your question uh, I'm in the, uh, the middle of nowhere you know of online human resources like other meetups yes I do actually know uh, maybe you uh, can look it up on Facebook there is the user experience professional association page uh, UXPA they have some uh, very interesting uh, webinars also and um, I try to keep this uh, recording also for the offline meetup so we can uh, also provide some resources uh, online, even if we are back to normal, uh, let's say, uh, so we can provide at, at least uh, slides or something uh, that you can uh, see or listen to. So uh, if anyone else uh, knows about um, other meetups um, or uh, maybe also podcasts. Uh, if you're uh, German speaking, there is a new podcast from Graz, UX Heroes. Maybe you've heard about that. It's in German, unfortunately, so um, only for German people uh, or German speaking people. Uh, but I uh, recommend it because they're uh, also talking about uh, practical things. And I see that uh, the how UX works in prax practice is uh, very, very important to a lot of people here. Um, who, in the ideas. So thanks for uh, the person who put this idea up uh, anonymous. Thank you. Um, I will try to find some additional um, talks about this topic. So I hope uh, this question, question is also answered and uh, maybe uh, anyone else uh, who's familiar or who, who knows about uh, additional um, resources, post them in the chat room. And uh, for now, I think um, if there's nothing more to say, we can stop the recording. Thanks again to Clemens and Clemens and uh, Parkside for providing us uh, all of this, uh, yeah, uh, technical things here and the two really great topics, great talks. And uh, I will be online. The meetup ends at 10 p.m. Um, at uh, Central European